Hello, my name is Tom Rummage and I'm in the Applications Engineering Department here at Micro Measurements. And now we're going to talk about bridge excitation levels. Okay, and why that's important and what you can do about it. First, let's talk about the different types of excitations. There are three basic types. There's the carrier, constant current, and constant voltage. And that's the order in which they are typically used in modern instrumentation. The carrier excitation, for those of you who are older and might remember it, is similar to the transition from AM radio, <coughs> lots of static, <coughs> lots of noise, to FM, frequency modulated, nice smooth music, good frequency response, everything was wonderful. That used the same principles as a carrier excitation. You take your excitation and you put it as a frequency and then you ride your uh, signal on top of it. You modulate it out, you demodulate it, and it can give you very, very stable and very, very accurate measurements. In fact, there's a, uh, uh, Vichay Nobel makes a product that has millivolt per volt to eight decimal places. Very, very stable, and it's used typically, carrier excitation is typically used in the development of transducers these days, where you need to have very accurate and very stable readings. <clears throat> One of the limitations is frequency response. The frequency of the carrier has to be uh, 10 times that of the signal or you're going to attenuate the uh, signal as you're or modulating out the signal. It's very typical of older instrumentation. The old P350, which has been discontinued for 35 years now, was use that uh, constant uh, or the carrier excitation very very stable okay very rarely used anymore the next excitation constant current constant current basically is used where you have either very long lead wires or very high temperature uh, situations where lead wire resistance might be thermocouple wire and it's got ohms per foot rather than tenths or hundreds of an ohm per foot <coughs> it removes the lead wire desensitization and or lead wire effects from the circuit. If you look at this from a standpoint of a, a constant current, V out is going to be the current times the resistance of the gauge. So if you're V out, if you want to have a, a 10 milliamp current, which is typical of constant current, you're putting that across a 120 ohm strain gauge your voltage drop across that is going to be 1.2 volts. Conversely, the small signal, that 10 milliamps of signal in a 0.24 ohm change, the actual strain signal is going to be 0.0024 volts. So you're going to saturate the front end with that big <coughs> 1.2 volts and then try and ride that 0.0024 volts on top of it. What most people will do <coughs> is AC couple the input of the instrument taking that 1.2 volt DC offset out of the picture and looking at peak to peak or dynamic strains only and then when you're working with a jet engine and working with turbine blades that dynamic signal is what most people are looking for the final excitation would be constant voltage and this is the one that's used in probably about 98-99% of the instrumentation these days. Now, why do we want to know what the excitation voltage is? The Wheatstone Bridge is a passive device. Without an excitation going into it, it will produce no signal. The higher the excitation voltage you put in it, the better signal you'll get, or the higher signal per unit strain. Then you can turn down the gain on the instrument, potentially having lower noise. What is the excitation level for my application? Well, that kind of depends on a couple of factors. The first one, the size of the strain gauge. It's a little radiator. And the more, the bigger it is, the more heat it can dissipate of the excitation that's going through it. When you run an excitation through a strain gauge, the current per cost produces heat, and that heat must be dissipated. So, bigger radiator, better uh, heat dissipation, so the size of the gauge. The next is its resistance, so you'll have less heat. So the higher resistance would be a better uh, 
situation. And finally, the material properties to which you're bonding the gauge. What kind of a heat sink is it? Is it like copper or aluminum, which are excellent heat sinks? Or is it like plastic or glass, which are very poor heat sinks? So the higher the, excite, or the, the, higher the heat sink capability, the more excitation you can put into it before you reach a phenomenon called grid self-heating. Now we do have a tech note, tech note 502, that allows you, that shows you the calculations for predicting what your maximum excitation would be. Now there's several steps in using this tech note. First, we're going to establish that our accuracy requirements. We're going to make, make a static, static measurement. We're looking for moderate accuracy and we're going to have it bonded to an excellent heat sink, aluminum, and a very poor heat sink, unfilled plastic. So the watts per square inch for a moderate accuracy is 5 to 10 watts per square inch. And down here at the uh, plastic, it would be 0.02 to 0.05 watts per square inch. Very much different. Okay, So we're going to have the, both the 5 to 10 and the 0.0 to 0.05 represented. Now, this is a chart that's in Tech Note 502. We're going to select a strain gauge, the 250UW, which is typical of our uh, workshops. And I'm going to show you the lines where the watts per square inch, the diagonal lines, intersect with the uh, excitation voltage and the resistance, I mean, the uh, pattern's size. So if I look at this from a standpoint, I'm going to go up there. <clears throat> This is the square inches. This is your watts per square inch, the diagonal lines. And if you look there at a good heat sink, moderate accuracy, you could put between 10 and 15 volts of excitation into that gauge and assume that you're going to have limited or no grid self-heating. Now we take that very same strain gauge and instead of putting it onto a piece of aluminum, a very good heat sink, we put it onto a piece of plastic, that 0.02 to 0.05 watts per square inch. Now, because the plastic is such a poor heat sink, we're limited to 0.7 to 1 volt of excitation. Very, very big difference. If you overheat the strain gauge, you will make it go unstable. That typically drifts off in the positive direction. Okay, I've got set up here a demonstration demonstrating the effects of grid self-heating or the lack thereof. I've got a beam with a um, 250 thousandths active grid gauge, 120 ohms on a piece of polycarbonate. Call that a poor heat sink. I've got the very same strain gauge bonded to a uh, same strain gauge bonded to aluminum material, which is an excellent heat sink. The difference between them is will be the grid self-heating. I also am hooked up to the System 8000 and I'm using a LabVIEW program. The System 8000 comes with a <coughs> programmer's reference manual which allows me to have uh, the ability to write my own programs. I'm going to connect to the scanner. It's asking me do I want to zero the channels which is typical and I'm going to do that. I'm now going to look at the graph. Now this is both the um, book gauge on the aluminum and the gauge on the steel and they're scrolling by. Now I'm going to set the excitation. It's currently set to 1 volt. I'm going to set it to 5 volts. You'll see a large offset change because the excitation makes the zero offset bigger. And then you'll be able to see what's called grid self-heating. The white line is the gauge on the aluminum. The light green line, or yellow line, whichever you're seeing, is the plastic part. <clears throat> Notice on the top right you can see the plastic part is already at 150 microstrain offset. The aluminum beam is rock stable at minus 24, and if I could re-zero it, that would still be re good zero. Note the line for the uh, uh, plastic part has is, is got an asymptotic shape. It's going to come up to what I would call equilibrium. And if you leave it long enough, it will get to a point where it's doing a lazy sine wave. As the temperature of the grid goes up, its resistance goes up. When its resistance goes up, 
the current goes down. When the current goes down, the heat goes down. And it's a little roller coaster. You'll see that instability when you've overheated the strain gauge. Drop back from uh, the excitation voltage that's causing that, and you've eliminated that instability. That being said, if you have a significant noise problem, and you're having so much noise that you can't recognize your signal, you might, with malice and forethought, go ahead and overheat the strain gauge, giving you more signal per unit strain because you can tolerate that instability at zero. You have to understand that and tolerate it. Now if you watch what happens here, as soon as I hit the, go back to the one volt of excitation, that initial offset will reduce and it'll begin immediately decaying back to the original zero. The plastic will cool off. And this is a practical demonstration of grid self-heating. If you have a very accurate static reading, then you must avoid grid self-heating. Minimize the excitation to avoid that. In order to get the best signal-to-noise ratio, however, you want to maximize the excitation. Now that tech note gives you a good idea of where to start, but the very best way to maximize your excitation is to do it empirically. Start off at a relatively low excitation voltage and look at your zero. Is it rock stable? incrementally increase that excitation and each time you do that your offset will change but your zero will remain relatively stable. When you reach what's called grid self-heating the offset will occur and then it'll wander off just like this graph here showing you that it's going off in the positive direction. You've reached grid self-heating. Drop back one increment, verify that that has restabilized your, in your input and then I drop about 5% off that for cheap insurance. You don't want to overheat the gauge under any circumstances. So that's the way to do it empirically. Excitation voltage. Questions?